Welcome back to Untaming Masculinity, the podcast where we tackle issues relevant to men and their journeys to reclaim their masculinity. I'm Dan, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host and good friend Brad. What is going on, man? Not much, man. It's a it's a good Wednesday out here. Just enjoying the weather. It's really, really beautiful. Um, I don't know. Not really much to report. What about you? What's going on? Not much here. It's been a it's been a busy week. You know, like usual. I feel like I say that every time, but of course, <laughs> you know, we're we're sitting down to record right now in the. Uh, and the gardeners decide to show up. So if you hear a little humming in the background or a dog going crazy barking at people outside, that's that's my house. Yeah, so. My kids are upstairs eating mac and cheese, banging around, watching a show. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, we've got a we've got a guest today that I want to introduce. Um, he's a former powerlifter, professional strongman, turned strength and conditioning coach. Uh, after years of owning a brick and mortar gym, he founded his online coaching business in 2016 and since then he's grown into one of the online one of the largest online coaching companies in the world he's got a staff of nearly 60 coaches and over the last five years they've served nearly 5,000 clients so on top of that he's a husband a father and he has a pretty entertaining podcast as well so welcome to the show matt reynolds thanks guys thanks for having me i'm excited to do the show no we appreciate it i've uh i've been listening to you to you and the barbell logic podcast for a uh, a long time now and uh it's it's great to finally touch base with you. So yeah, same. Excellent. So I wanted to start and, you know, obviously you've got kind of a, a long career in the, uh, in the strength sports and, and in coaching. Can you kind of fill everyone in on your history? Anybody who doesn't know you, just give you the, kind of the quick overview of, of how you got started and, and where you are sure. now. And then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, for sure. Um, man, I was, I was, uh, I love playing sports growing up. Uh, I was super competitive to a, to a fault that's continued on. I'm in my mid forties now and, uh, I'm the old guy with a nice lawn in the neighborhood. That, uh, <laughs> nice. the kids get off and, you know, trying to, trying to compete against my neighbors, I guess at this point for the best grass. Uh, and so yeah, I wasn't a great athlete. Uh, again, I was decent and, uh, got into college, wasn't good enough to play college sports and, 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 uh, actually got lucky that in the early days of the internet in the late nineties, uh, back when there weren't very many, uh, websites out there. I, I read a, uh, a article back in the late nineties called how to bench press 600 pounds. And, uh, it was by a guy named Dave Tate, who was, uh, out of West side barbell and, and owns elite FTS, which is a big, uh, mm -hmm. equipment company manufacturer now. And, uh, I, I thought at the time that probably four or five guys in the world could bench press 400 pounds. I didn't know 600 was possible and, uh, read about the sport and I was like, Oh, you eat copious amounts of pizza and, uh, and, uh, lift heavy weights and, uh, put on as much weight as you can. And I was like, this sounds awesome. Let's do that. Cause I, I knew I didn't want to do bodybuilding. I knew I didn't want to put on a pink thong bikini and have beauty pageants with other dudes. That was not where I was going to go. And so, uh, I wasn't really into tanning and oiling my body up. And so, and so not that there's anything wrong with that, but, uh, no, I was, so, uh, I got into powerlifting and, uh, you know, I kind of was all in and, uh, did that in the late nineties, early two thousands. And, and uh, did pretty well in powerlifting. Now, you know, there's a lot of guys with with strong legs and strong backs. And, power, you know, powerlifting is a sport where you squat, bench press, and deadlift, and they combine the your PRs there. And so I was decent. Um, my best lifts raw. So back in those days, I actually used a lot of powerlifting gear. So you would put on, like, imagine the tightest pair of, of uh, overalls you could ever put on, try to squat with those, where you know you're not going to blow the butt out. Uh, and so it's kind of ridiculous and, like, really tight denim shirts and stuff. And so... Uh, so I, I won't talk about the numbers I hit in those cause I feel like that was cheating. But, uh, in my, in my raw days, which is just like, you know, it's wearing, you know, gym shorts, really a wrestling singlet, wrestling singlet and knee sleeves. I, uh, I squatted 605, I bench pressed 460 and I deadlifted 725 and I totaled elite, which is the top level, uh, in powerlifting in, in the 220s, 242s, 275s and 308s. So my, when I started doing this, I was maybe 180 pounds. And got up to over 300 pounds. So put on over 100 pounds of body weight over the course of a couple years. Uh, probably not super healthy and, and probably lots of a fair amount of fat gain at the time <laughs> as well. And, uh, so did that in the early 2000s and then turned my attention to strongman in 2005. Uh, just wanted to change a pace and wanted to keep lifting heavy. I love lifting heavy. I love the value of strength. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that. Um, and so I, I just wanted to something different than just the three main lifts. And so there was a professional power lifter. I'm, I'm in the Ozarks in Southwest Missouri and there was a professional power or professional strongman up in Kansas city and, uh, ended up calling him up and try to figure out how to get into the sport, went up and trained with him and, and, uh, got super sore and, you know, did all the big heavy stones, the Atlas stones and that stuff. And, 
and I, I was kind of bitten by the bug and I was in. Um, while, while I was very average in in uh, sports and team sports growing up, and, and while I was good at powerlifting, it didn't come easy to me. Um, something happened with strongman and I was just, I was better at strongman than anything I'd ever done. And so, uh, I went to Kansas strongest man in 2005 and, and my first contest and won the whole thing. And then won Oklahoma strongest man and then one Missouri strongest man. And I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm actually decent at this. I can remember my first show at Kansas strongest man. I did not have a very good contest and I still won. And I remember thinking, you know, if this has been a powerlifting meet, I would have gotten killed. Uh, but I thought, how do I have not a great day and still win the whole thing? I, I must be better at this than I than I think I am, and so uh, strongman. I, I was decently strong, and strongman's got a lot of of skill type stuff. I mean, you've, you've got to be there, there. There's a lot of there's a lot of skill based events, you know, things like the yoke and and the farmer's walks, and even how to flip a tire or how to pick up heavy stones, things like that. And so once I once I learned the skill that I needed to acquire, I was I was pretty strong. I, again, I had a pretty strong back and was over a seven uh, over seven hundred pound deadlifter, and so. Uh, I won my pro card in 2006 in strongman at Utah's strongest man, won that actually in Salt Lake City, by where you're at, and uh, won it at the same show that Brian Shaw was at, who's since won the world strongest man, I think four times. So he won the super heavies and I won the light heavies. And uh, we were kind of off to the races and uh, got to compete on the world strongest man circuit for three years. I opened a gym in 2008 called Strong Gym. I was actually a teacher, a public school teacher. I'm thankful that we've homeschooled our kids. As a matter of fact, my my 18 year old daughter just uh, graduated homeschool high school. We've got her big, actually have her ceremony and, and, uh, and event party tomorrow night and uh, excited for that. And so she's been homeschooled since the second grade and uh, glad I got out of teaching. I, I completed my master's to be a high school principal. And uh, by the time I finished my master's, I knew that wasn't the direction I was going to go. Uh, opened a gym in 2008. And so kind of did the gym and teaching for a while. And within a few years, I was making more money as a, as a strength coach and a gym owner than I was as a teacher, which is not that hard to do when you're making 32 grand a year, <laughs> year as a teacher. <laughs> so I uh, ended up uh, leaving, leaving teaching and uh, running the gym full time. By 2012, that gym was the, the largest strength gym in the country, the largest privately owned strength gym in the country, which is, which is I think, saying a lot for a town in Springfield, Missouri of 200,000 people. It was, I say that it was, it was a perfect sized town for what we did. You know, it was uh, 200,000 in the city and 500,000 in the metro and all 500,000 are within 15 minutes of the gym. We, we bought a downtown uh, location in a kind of gentrified area and, and redid the, redid the building. And so it was very successful, uh, sold the gym in 2015 to one of my partners and went full time in the online space. And really I saw the, pr- the problem that I saw in, in the gym ownership while, while the atmosphere was great in the gym, it was one of the str- strongest gyms in the country. I was a slave to the location and a, and a slave to the schedule. And so when you personal train clients, you know, you've got to be there. At, I was there at 5 a.m. every morning and and training clients throughout the day. And you couldn't go on vacation. You couldn't take a break. And if I left the country and want to go to Mexico with my wife on vacation, you know, stuff would fall apart. And so uh, I thought there has to be a better way that provides some flexibility, not just for me, but for the clients as well. And so uh, I spent I spent most of 2016 developing systems and standard operating procedures to provide what I felt like was the best level of a sort of high touch service for online coaching. We, we didn't just program for people. I actually had my clients video themselves and, and upload those videos in the old days. It was on YouTube and, and emailed me the videos. And now we have our own software, our own app. And, um, and I broke down those videos within 24 hours every single time. So I just really focused on really excellent service. And, and what that, what that allowed my clients to do was pay significantly less money for coaching from me where I, you know, I, I would cost, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars a month for personal training or two hundred dollars an hour if you wanted to get me for, for one hour. And, and and online coaching was like two hundred dollars a month. So for the cost of one hour of coaching, you could get a month worth of coaching for online training. I still broke down on your videos. And of course, they had the flexibility to train anywhere they want, anytime they want with the equipment they had from anywhere in the world. And I got to do the same as a coach. I got to if I had Internet and had my laptop, I could I could break down their videos and coach them. And so um, that really took off. And, and, uh, that the first year, uh, we did nearly a million dollars in, in revenue and it's just blown up since then. And so, uh, we're a big company now and yeah, we've got 60 employees. We've got another 75 coaches or so on top of that, that are contractors that, that work mm-hmm. for us and, and license out our software. Um, we're now providing online coaching to the military, the air force, EOD, special forces guys, um, and we've moved into the business to business space where we license out our software to other 
coaches in the fitness industry. And so uh, it's a blast. I mean, I, I still coach and our software is so efficient that uh, at the time when, when I when I hired a bunch of staff and expanded the business, I had about 100 clients. I ended up backing down to about 10 clients so I could just run the business as the software has become more efficient, I'm back up over 30 clients. So I have about 30, a little over maybe 32 or 33 clients that I still coach now. Um, and I do that in about 30 or 40 minutes every morning. I get up super early, you know, at 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning and break, break down videos and do kind of the urgent work and emails and notifications. And then I get to spend the rest of my day as a, as a CEO. And I think that number gets uh, that, that name, that term uh, title gets thrown around a lot, but, uh, we, we've converted from a, a Missouri LLC to an S Corp to a full Delaware C Corp over the last several years. And, and we're a pretty good sized corporation with the board of directors. And so I'm, I'm like an actual CEO that does CEO stuff. And I love that life. And so while I still love to coach and I love to lift and I still lift heavy and enjoy it, uh, my life is really, you know, mostly known as a businessman at this point. So I've really kind of gone through the transition of being uh, a decently well known lifter to a, a fairly well known strength coach to now business owner and CEO and, uh, and just love the life I get to lead. Wow. That is a, uh, it, it's quite the evolution for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on, on the show, we talk a lot about obviously masculinity and, and how that, that evolves into it. So sh- when, when somebody talks about masculinity, strength is, is, is a very related topic, right? It, it seems to go almost hand in hand. So I was wondering if you could riff a little bit on how your career has kind of helped define your views of masculinity. Sure. Yeah. So I, I, I'm actually a Southern Baptist preacher's kid and, uh, I was absolutely like the, from like the old muscle magazines that had the 90 pound weakling. I was the nerdy weakling. You know, I was smart and did well in school, but I, I had no confidence, like very low self-esteem, um, hit puberty really late, like between my sophomore and junior year of high school, which is, I met my wife in the eighth grade and then she was two years older than me. And of course she, she looked at me as, uh, you know, just the little brother for, for five years. And, <laughs> and so, uh, weight really changed that for me. So I, I got into lifting my senior year of high school and watched my body change and, and, and the physical changes were tremendous, but, uh, it was really the mental and emotional and social changes that occurred for me that, that I saw as a, a real benefit of, of strength training. And so, you know, I, it, it brought on a level of confidence that I hadn't, uh, experience before and it, it wasn't arrogance and we, we all know the bodybuilders that walk around with their chest puffed out and the imaginary lat syndrome and and it, it wasn't that it was just um i had confidence to carry myself well and and to um to project the masculinity that that i wanted to project and so uh we while i watched that you know firsthand we had firsthand knowledge of how that changed my life I've now watched that occur with thousands of our clients at, at Barbell Logic and, you know, and even in the gym before that. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think a lot about, um, you know, in, in Proverbs, it says uh, that the glory of man is a strength, the glory of young men are their strength. And it, li- it literally, like if you go back to the, he- to the Hebrew, it literally means the physical strength. It's not, you know, the strength is a word that we toss around. It's kind of like love in, in English where there's, there's, we only have one word for the thing. Like we love pizza and we love our dog and we love our wife and we love, our, you know, all those things. And those are all different levels of love and strength is kind of the same thing. Somebody will be cancer and they'll say, well, they're really strong. Well, that's not really strength. It's just like mental toughness, which is great and important. Um, but strength is l- literally the ability to produce force. And so as you're able to produce more force, which is just a co- totally general physiological adaptation what I've found is that it allows me to be much better at what I believe my calling is as a, as a husband and a father, as a leader in my church, as a, as a business owner, all of those things are better because of strength. And I don't think strength is the be all end all. I think there's lots of things that are more important than that, but I, I do think strength generally applies to everyone and not, and by the way, not just men. I mean, my, my wife is strong and she's as feminine as she could possibly be. Uh, but it's, it's changed her confidence level as well. And so in the way she carries herself. And so, uh, you know, I think strength is such a valuable tool that when we choose what, what we do when we do strength, right? When like take a squat, squats suck. Nobody wants to do squats. You got to put a heavy barbell on your back and nobody's ever going to make you squat. Like you have to decide to do that for yourself. And so we've coined a term at Barbell Logic that we call voluntary hardship. When you choose to do hard things, it refines you and makes you better. And so there are times in life when we're thrown into involuntary hardship. Somebody gets sick, somebody gets cancer, you know, somebody dies, you go to prison. Like what those things are not guaranteed to refine. And you know, we 
Guys go to prison all the time. Don't get refined. They get worse. Right now, you could be refined by involuntary hardship. You can be refined by cancer. You can be refined by tragedy, but but you're not guaranteed it. But but I would argue that when you choose voluntary hardship for the right reasons, you're almost always refined by those things. And so what I found is that it makes me a better man. It makes me a better husband. It makes me a better father. It makes me a better leader. And, you know, I, I, I think a lot back to C.S. Lewis also said, he said, we're building a nation of men, men without chess. And like, is he talking about literal or figurative? Well, I think both. And when we do these hard things, when we choose to do hard things, look, I'm, I'm a CEO. I, I work at a desk all day. I, I sit on a laptop. I'm not out farming. I'm not, I'm not working on combines. I'm not a mechanic. I'm not, I don't do manual labor. I'm not in a, I'm not in a mine. And so things that maybe our grandfathers, our great grandfathers did, I, I would actually argue maybe they didn't need strength training as much as we do. I, w- I would definitely argue that they didn't need it as much as we did. They probably still needed it. We need it tremendously. We are, we are living in a culture where we live on our phones and our laptops and our TVs and Netflix. Like this is often the only physical hard thing we do. I mean, you know, you talked about your, your gardeners are there. Same thing happens to me. Like guys show up at my house and mow my lawn. I don't mow my lawn. And so I don't. <laughs> Right. This is what I do. That's hard. Is walk into the gym and put a bar on my back and squat. I'm 44 years old. Like it does. It hurts now. I'm old and I'm you know and I'm everything creaks and aches, but I still do the thing. Uh, I this morning I trained uh, one of my favorite clients. She's an 87 year old lady and she squatted and deadlifted today. She deadlifted 115 pounds for sets of five at 87 with double hip replacements and a knee replacement. You know all those things before I met her. And it's dramatically changed her life. So in the same way, it changes our life and allows us to really see the fullness of masculinity. It does the same for an 87-year-old woman, just just, just not masculinity. It just helps her perform in life better. Uh, and so I think one of the things that, that's allowed Barbara Logic to be so successful is that while most online coaching companies in the fitness world, but by the way, I, I hate the fitness world. It is so rife with aesthetics and shallow. It's like as shallow as the, you know, the kitty side of the pool that very few people are trying to reach general population and trying to do strength training for improvement of quality of life. It's about taking pictures of your abs or your butt or look good on the, on the beach. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to look better. Everybody wants to look better, but like if that's the end goal of what you're doing, that's incredibly shallow. And so for us, we're trying to reach normal people who are trying to improve their quality of life, get healthier, get stronger, and be better in their calling, and if, whether you're a man or a woman. So for men that, you know, to be a better man, to lead well, to, to protect and provide for your family, those things that we're called to do. And so it has been such a clear, direct relationship between strength training and being able to do those things well. So it's, it's made a huge difference in my life. I love that term, voluntary hardship, but it's so, it's, it's highly applicable if you think about it. You know, I think about the areas in which I've grown. It wasn't tearing my ACL. It wasn't my wife going through cancer. You know, those things were hard, but as you said, they are involuntary hardships that were kind of placed upon us. It's going to the gym. It's lifting something heavy. It's going to jujitsu and somebody choking me out or trying to break my arm. Those are the things which I've realized in my life have cultivated my mind and made me better. And it kind of calls us back to, you know, whether you want to go back to John Eldridge and Wild at Heart. And everything that we're looking for is men. You know, we're looking for an adventure to live. We're looking for beauty to rescue. We're looking for all these attributes and all these things. And naturally, we've wanted them for a long time. But the world in which we live, a world of convenience and comfort, you know, it's created this almost dissonance, this cognitive dissonance within men specifically. You know, it can apply to all, you know, women, et cetera. But I guess talk to us a little bit about, you know, you, you mentioned a concept when, you know, Dan reached out to you about, Strength training and how it helps shape our masculine identity. Like identity is a very big word. You know, that's something there's a lot of meaning, a lot of connotation behind that. So talk to us a little bit about how you've seen in your life and in your coaching personally, how your masculine identity and masculine identities of of men have been shaped through picking up heavy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. And I love the way you've, you, you verbalize that it's, it's, you know, First off, I'm really grateful that Barbell Logic is a, is a big business, and we, we've really tried to be careful to stay as balanced and neutral as we can politically and religiously as a business. But the the business has allowed me to be able to go on podcasts like yours and other podcasts and speak a little more transparently about my own life, so that I can I can speak in some truth into this stuff. 
And so, man, I, I just, I feel really strongly that we have a calling as men to be masculine. And we know that the culture is at war with those things right now. We, you know, that this, this concept of toxic masculinity, um, and, and, you know, can you take, can you take masculinity too far? Can you take patriarchy too far? Can you like, of course, like you can lord. Oh, as a matter of fact, we see this and again, not to get uber religious on you guys, but you see this in like Genesis three, even the original fall is like, this is, this is the curse. The curse is that there is going to be a war between husbands and wives on who will, the wife will try to take control of her husband and the, and the husband will lord over her in a, in an unhealthy way. And we're not called to do that, but we are called to be masculine. We're called to be strong. We're called to be, we're called to be muscular. We're called to be, to perform. We, we need to be able to be strong enough to perform at what anything life throws at us. We, we want to project with some amount of authority. We want to, like all of these things matter. And while there are lots of things that you can do that will improve that, I still would argue that strength training is the most broad, general thing that works for everybody. Listen, there's tons of voluntary hardship stuff you can do. Like you can go out and run marathons. That's voluntary hardship. I don't want to do that. I don't want to run 26 miles. That sounds terrible, right? But also there's, you know, there are other things that we're called to do. Like, you know, I I always am careful about, I, I've gotten up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock my whole life. It's not a Jocko Willink, like discipline over freedom sort of thing. Like I just wake up at that time. I like getting up. That, as a matter of fact, I got up at 3.30 this morning. I woke up and I was like, I don't, I love my life. I got work to do. I got good coffee to drink. Let's go, you know? And so, and so I, I go to work, but I, but I think having the amount of discipline to do the work and provide the thing that really helps, uh, shape my masculinity is not the days that the training comes easy or the work comes easy. It's the opposite. It's the days I don't want to train, but I go into the gym and I handle it like a blue collar worker and I punch my time card and I get in and get out. Or when I get up and I love the work that I'm going to get to do today, it's the days I get up and I don't want to work or I slept terrible or my hips hurt or my kid was sick last night and we didn't sleep very well. I mean, I get up and do the thing anyway. Like that's the thing that refines my masculinity. And so strength training has just supported that from a foundational level at at every place along the way. So I, I look at who I was when I was 19 or 20 or 21 years old, you know, sort of lost in my ways and and you know, not confident, no self esteem, and 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 very little strength and no muscularity. My, I had a great dad and he loved me and he loved my mom and he treated her great, but he taught me nothing about being a man. Nothing. Didn't teach me how to lo- love my wife. Uh, even though, even though he modeled it well, he didn't teach me that. Didn't teach me about money or debt or business or finance or, you know, he taught me the Bible and he taught me church. And again, he was a preacher. And so he, and I'm thankful that he gave me those things, but he didn't give me anything else. And so, so all along the way, while I learned, while I had to learn those things on my own, strength training supported all of that. And so it, it's just, I, I don't want to overplay the value of it because I, I, while I think it's incredibly important, I don't think it's the most important thing. I don't think it's more important than loving my wife. I don't think it's more important than providing for my family. And I, and I do see people who push too hard in the fitness industry and it becomes their entire life. It becomes their God. It becomes their idol. I, I don't want that. But if we do it for the right reason, if we choose voluntary hardship for the, for quality of life improvement and to be the men that we're called to be, to protect, to provide, to be a husband, to be a father, to be a leader, to be a citizen, to, you know, all of those things. I think it does an incredible job of supporting those. And so and that's what it's done in my life. And again, if that was, if that were a, if my experience were only my experience, then it is a, you know, it's a, it's an example of one, but because we've had thousands and thousands of clients and coaches that have done this, I've watched this be not, I am not the exception to the rule. I'm the norm. And, and it's the norm, even if you're an 87 year old lady, like it, it, it helps you be the person you're supposed to be improving your quality of life and making you better handle life, whether that's physical hardship that gets thrown at you or whether it's your girlfriend breaks up with you or your wife divorces you or you lose your job or whatever the thing is, we, we live a incredibly pampered lifestyle in the West where people have never done anything hard and they get something hard thrown at them and their entire life falls apart because they don't know how, how to handle hard. And I'm telling you, when you put a bar on your back and it's got three and you got 315 pounds on it, and you do three sets of five and you grind out all three sets of five and you barely get the last rep and you see Jesus at the end and then you have to come back two days later and put five more pounds on the bar. That's hard. And so, you know, some people say like, yeah, it's just weightlifting. Like, yeah, but it's it's one of the hardest things I can choose to do. And so when those other things occur, uh, man, I've, I've gone through t- 
crazy. I mean, I got sued by my mentor. I thought the business was going to go under a few years ago. There's all kinds of tough stuff. I was better able to handle those things because I chose voluntary hardship, primarily in the, in the squat rack. And that's, that's what it's done for me. Yeah. It's a concept of just proving to yourself in, in a relatively safe area that you can endure hard things and get through yep. them and, and mentally conquer them and physically conquer them as well, but mentally survive that situation so that when you get that involuntary situation, you've got that experience to, to, to fall back on that. It, it is really strong. And I've had similar experience, you know, with, with my strength journey and, and that kind of thing with training. And it's, it seems to be that whenever you're training hard and something bad happens, it's, it's never as bad as, as it would have seemed before. Yeah. You know, Cause you've got that to fall back on and you have the gym. By the way, also the, good, the good's the same way. Yeah. It's never as good as you think it is, and it's never right. as bad as you think it is, right? And so you're exactly. just – there's also something about strength training that sort of keeps you grounded. It's just like it's going to be okay. I mean I am – as a as a CEO of a business of our size, I'm the ultimate optimist. I know that like we're going to figure it out make it work. This is the only option. If it doesn't work, I lose my house. That's the way it works. So And so <laughs> you make it work. And so um, – you know, but, but it also – when times are great, it allows you to just sort of see the forest through the trees – and step back and say like, okay, we're going to enjoy. And I'm in, I'm in that time right now. I had a great call. You guys probably know Brett McKay from Art of Manliness. He's, he's one of my clients that have done his podcast several times and we had a good chat a couple hours ago. And he was asking me how things were going. I said, I think things are going better than it's ever gone in my whole life. But, I, but I also recognize that this is also just a season that won't last. Like hardships are still going to come. There's the next thing that's going to come. And that, and that doesn't mean I live my life scared or anxious. It just, I just am ready to take on what life gives me and, um, and here we go. And so whether that's the good with the bad. It draws me to the Latin saying, I mean, I'm going to butcher this, but it's out in, in vinium, vm out facium, or I will find them. I shall either find a way or make one. That's a yeah. term that Dan and I have coined in our lives. Like you're going to find a way or you're going to make one regardless. Yep. Situation's going to hit you. Something's going to be terrible. There's always a way through. And I'll tell you something. What if you, you haven't done that? Yeah. What if you haven't done that on your own because of voluntary hardship, right? How are yeah. you supposed to find a way or make one when involuntary hardship comes if you haven't ever forced yourself into that? Yeah. And so, I, you know, the, I'm very lucky that the guys in my church, we, we planted a church uh, about a year ago, and uh, they're all pretty hardcore dudes. We, we did this crazy camping trip. I say camping trip. It was like a seven mile hike up the side of a mountain. Which I thought, nice. I thought we were just going to camp in like hammocks. And I was like, it wasn't tents. We we're going to hammock camp. I was like, this is pretty hardcore because we're going to, and then it was like a literally a seven mile. We're, we're three quarters of the hike. I was on all fours. Like you couldn't walk up the mountain on <laughs> just two legs. I was like, what are you doing to me? You know, these guys all weigh like 170 pounds and I'm crawling up at 250. But if you haven't done those things and you know, there were times, I mean, really, there were times on that hiking trip. I was like, we're actually at a spot. I don't know if I can go on and there is no way a helicopter can come in and save me at this point. Like it, that's it. Like I got to figure out a way out. Like e either I'm getting up this mountain or I'm going to have a heart attack. One of the two. And you know, and, and in the midst of it, you're in the stuck and it's terrible. But afterwards you're like, I'm really glad I did the thing so that when you get presented with the involuntary hardship, you're like, now I understand that I don't get to give up. I, I actually doesn't even compute in my head. People that, I've thought about this too as a business owner. I see business owners all the time and I know a lot of people are not, most people are not wired to be business owners where like really hard things come to business. That's what's going to happen. And they just, they give up and I've just, it's just never crossed my mind. And I, I look back and I go, I know why that is because I've spent 20 years under the barbell doing hard things so that when I'm, you know, when I get thrown into a, a federal lawsuit where I think like this could be it, I it can't be it. This is, we got to figure out a way out of this thing. We got to make a way to do this. And so that, that's what the training is. And so people often think about what strength training is as the, just the, okay, yeah, you're going to get big muscles, you're going to get strong, you're more force production. And all those things are fantastic, but it's the other stuff that's really great. It's the, it's the mental refinement, the emotional, the social that occurs from doing those things. That's what I love about it. There's so much to be said that you've stared down a challenge, you have overcome it, you have told yourself you can do it. Yep. By choosing that, by choosing, you know, choosing your heart, if you will, you've proven to yourself something. And that yep. has, that has incredible sub, subliminal and subconscious effect on you. It really yep. can help strive you forward and push you forward. That's awesome. Yeah. What's great too about strength training is, you know, when you're, when you're presented with hardship in life, it's, it's sort of hard to compare this hardship to that hardship. Was this harder? Was that thing harder? But in, in the weight room, 
there's weight on the bar. So if, if you squat 350 and you've never squatted 350 before, you're like, that's the hardest thing I've ever done. And now I got to add five pounds and I do 355. I'm like, that's the hardest thing I've ever done. And so, you know, we, we love metrics. Matter of fact, one of the reasons we developed our own software at Barbell Logic is because we track, we auto track every PR, not one rep. I mean, yes, one rep maxes, but everything, three sets of eight, five sets of five, three sets of five barbell curls, you know, dips, chin ups, whatever stuff that you would never remember. Oh, wow. I just hit uh, three sets of chin up. PR. I wouldn't know. And the app tells you to congratulate a PR. Like those are those little dopamine rushes that you get that you can see like very clear improvement over time. It's, it's really hard. You know, every time I've got my one daughter is 18, I was talking about her and another one is, is, uh, almost 13. And, you know, so we, we deal with hard parental things all the time and it's hard to go back and go, was this harder than the thing we dealt with four months ago? But in the weight room, you know exactly how hard it was because there's weight on, there's a load. And I, I love that too, that you can always see exactly what your improvement is and, and see the, the progress you've made over the years. I still, every once about every six months or so, I go back to my original training journal, you know, in a little, like a, an actual composition book and mm-hmm. open it up and look like, Oh, look, I was squatting 155 and, and it, look how far I've come. So like, you know, when you struggle in the weight room, you're like, I'm struggling. I'm not hitting the reps that I want to hit. I've, I've just lost, I've lost about 50 pounds over the last six months or so. And so, you know, my strength is it's hard to hit PRs losing 50 pounds of body weight. But I, but I look at what I'm doing now and I can look at what I was doing 10 years ago. I'm some five times as strong as I was then. And so while I'm not quite as strong as I was six months ago, I'm a lot healthier and I'm 50 pounds lighter and I've, you know, I've done these things. And so it's very easy. Those, those PRs matter. And so we track those things. Those things really, really are super cool. Uh, you speak my language of the metric stuff. I am, I am definitely like a numbers guy and, and I track a lot yeah. of that stuff as well. And it, 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 you're right. It's, you know, it, it's that old saying of, you know, what is measured is, is improved in right. terms of being able to just track that and see where you go. But I think it also plays to the, the larger conversation that we were having about how when you do that, you prove to yourself that you can grow through those voluntary hardships. And you also show that even if it's tough today, you've, you've moved forward in the world and you've moved forward in your journey. That's you know, right. it's, um, that, that concept of just putting in the work consistently and getting an outcome that is down the road, something that you're, you're looking to achieve, but you, you can't necessarily see that end goal where you are right now. Yep. Exactly. It's great. So change gears a little bit. You know, you, you mentioned your, your daughters. I've got twin 14 or almost 14 year olds now. Mm. So I kind of know right. the boat Sorry, you're bro. shaking your head. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're entering high school next year, so that should be fun. But um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how having daughters has helped you view your role as a man, your role at, in in the world, and and how that might have been different, say, had you had sons. Sure. Dramatically different. Yeah. <laughs> how basic <laughs> you want to get. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's, oh, dude. Um, it's changed everything. Um you know, I, I have, I have, a, I'm, if I'm not careful, I'll get emotional talking about this stuff. I just, um, I, I have been refined a lot in my thinking of these things over the last several years, um, especially having an 18 year old who we're preparing, uh, at some point to, you know, to give away in marriage. And, um, okay. with my daughters, you know, my, my 18 year old daughter has, her last name is Reynolds because I, I am, I'm the head, I'm her head. I'm, I'm the head of this household. And I love her. We have an incredible relationship. Um, and her last name will be Reynolds until the day I give her to her husband where she'll take on a different name and, and, um, and he will be her head. And, um, and so, um, she, she, you know, she has a guy she's very close friends with right now. They're, they're not dating, but I can see it's going to move that direction. And, um, and so the process of preparing her for, um, being a wife and a mom and, um, and preparing him on how to be the man he must be if he is to marry my daughter is incredibly important. And so, um, you know, we, we, we feed a lot of wisdom into our kids as, as well as our 13, 12, 13 year old, um, in preparing her at five, six, seven years away from the same thing. And so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, it's different. If you have a son, you are preparing a son to learn the skills he needs to leave the home and go find a wife. Uh, and again, probably all your listeners will not agree with this. And I apologize for being so insanely based. Most of them probably no. will agree with this. <laughs> but with my wife or with my daughters, I'm preparing my daughters to to find a husband, but not leave the home. Like th- this is, and, and again, I, I wouldn't judge anybody for sending their daughters off to college, but like we're not sending our daughters off to college. 
that she's she's going to pursue education beyond high school but she she's here and she lives under our home and she and she um participates as a member of this family and we prepare and we're incredibly blessed and like my wife was also a kindergarten teacher for for 13 years and and we joke around and say she got to retire at like 33 or something like that and so she's been a stay at home mom wife and mom uh for, you know for the past 12 years and um and so they watch the life that my that we live that we lead um we certainly don't do it perfectly but we've got a great relationship in our family i get to work from home i run this big multi-million dollar business from home. My wife stays at home. We eat dinners together. We, you know, we eat our meals together. We get up in the morning. My daughters have, uh, very intentional, uh, I say chores. So we don't, we don't pay our daughters for cleaning their rooms. So that's, that's required. Um, right. but, but I pay them well to, they work for us, but they do, they do house skills, life skills, the kind of stuff they'll need to do to cultivate a home in, in the future, their own home. And so, and so we have thought through what those life skills are for daughters that they need to know to be productive wives and moms and to, and to cultivate their family and cultivate their home. Of course, my wife does a tremendous job of, of pouring wisdom into them and, and training them in that. It would be different with a son. It, it would be similar in that those, those life skills would be different. You know, I send him off in the woods and he'd have to camp on his own for three days and go, you know, there'd be these, <laughs> there would be these coming of age sort of things that would occur. And, uh, but you're preparing a son to leave and, and to build a home and to find a wife. And it's, it is different with, with daughters. And so at least I think it should be. Um, and that's, that's the way we've chosen to live our life. And, and I think if I, I sort of wish my daughters were out in the living room and they could come in here and, and tell you, like, they don't, I don't, I think they would tell you they don't feel like slaves to that. They enjoy, they want that. Um, you know, we sat down and have had lots of conversations with my 18 year old about what she wants to do after high school and, and, you know, talk through if she wanted to go to college or, or whatever the thing was. And, um, you know, she wants to be a, a highly educated person because she wants to be educated for the sake of education, not to get a diploma and go get a job and go be a, you know, go be a partner in a law firm. I don't want that for my daughter. And so, um, she wants to be highly educated and she wants to learn the skills she needs to know to be a wife and a mom and cultivate a home and be a, a wonderful Christian woman and learn from her mom and learn from me and the women in our church. And, and so we pour into them that way with that expectation. Uh, and so my job is to protect her, protect them, my daughters, my son, it's a little bit of the opposite is to put him out there and let him get hurt every once in a while. It's to scrape the knee. It's to break the nose. Is that like, those are valuable things to learn as a son, because those are the things you're going to have to know as a man. And so, yeah, it's definitely different. Yeah. Have you ever read the book, Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters by Meg Meeker? I, I, I actually have that book, but I haven't read it. I oh, hear it's great. man. Though. It's a phenomenal it's read. Good. It's it, it's a gut punch. It'll uplift yeah, you and it? tear you down simultaneously. But there's a concept she talks about in there in that our daughters give us authority that they will never give any other man, right? Like sure. their dad has authority in their life that they're going to use and they're going to view the world and they're going to view the man that they go off and marry through the lens by which they view their yeah. fathers. And it's a lot of pressure, right? If we are good oh, fathers um, and good men, they're going yeah. to look to find a man like us. If we are a bad man and a bad father, they're going to rebel against that. Yeah. So that goes hand in hand with what you're saying. You are showing your daughters the kind of man that you need to be and the kind of man that their future husband sh Sure as hell, better emulate. Yep, yeah, it's great. And it, I want to be clear. I always want to be careful when I'm. I'm. I'm probably transparent to a fault uh, on these things, but uh, I've not always been that man. I think you guys would probably say the same. Um, mm -hmm. I, man, I lived a, a life of of sin and destruction 10, 10 to fifteen years ago, and my eighteen year old was young, but remembers. And okay. um, and I'm I'm just thankful that God has reconciled our family and and recovered that and my marriage and and. So, you know, the, the last 10 years or so has really been a blessing for us. And so while I, I would wish that I had learned those lessons, having never gone through those things, uh, I'm thankful that we learned the lessons. And and I think for my 18 year old, and some of this may be in her personality, you know, she wasn't deeply affected in a negative way. She can look and see like I remember the bad times. That's what they call it, you know, and um, and knows what what life looks like now is is incredible. And so um yeah, I, I want to be careful not to not to judge, you know, guys that are listening that are hearing this or, and are are convicted or guilty about about what we're saying. Like there's there's all of this can be rescued and reconciled. That's what's so awesome mm -hmm. about this. So 
Um, but one of the things I think it's always important to say is that I also, I also do a lot of these podcasts that I think they often are, um, motivational, encouraging, but we have to be men of action. We have to do this thing. And so it's one thing to listen to the podcast and get excited. Like, yeah, I'm going to train. I'm going to be a better man and a better father. No, like do it today. Well, I don't have barbells and I don't like, I don't care. Go, go do run around the neighborhood. Listen, I'm the biggest proponent you'll ever find for barbells and strength training and linear progression and all that sort of stuff. But if you don't have, like go do something hard, you know, tell your wife you love her. Tell her she looks beautiful today. Like pour into your daughters, pour into your sons. These things matter. Do it today. Don't do it like, oh, I'm really excited. I want to be that guy. Like be the guy now. The second you're hearing this, pause the podcast, call your wife. And, and so I think that's important. I have this conversation all the time with people with strength train or business owners, you know, business owners are notorious for reading all the business books and never doing the thing. Like you read all the business books in the world, but you don't learn until you do the thing and doing the thing is the actual scary part. And so if we're not people of action, it doesn't work. And so as you hear this stuff, as it, as it, as it sort of, you know, pulls on a heartstring, whatever that is, whether it's about being a better man or better father or better husband or, or your, you know, your weak or you're, or you're overweight or you're out of shape, like change that right now with whatever you have. Go get on your bicycle, go get on your kid's bicycle and ride around the neighborhood. I don't care. Uh, you know, we, we have clients, we have tons of executives that, that are clients of ours. They travel all the time. I make them go to hotel gyms. If you guys have ever trained in hotel gyms, they're terrible. They got dumbbells up to 40 pounds. That's <laughs> it. Treadmills. Like, Hey, we're going to get a workout in. Are we going to be able to squat and deadlift? Nope. But you know, we're going to do something and we're going to maintain that consistency so that we build that habit to do the thing because we are people of action. We don't just talk about the thing. We do the thing and doing the thing is more important. And, you know, so it's, it's not even about, I, I do think motivation is a really strong push there. And, and I've had lots of conversations with guys like Brett McKay about this very thing. I, discipline is incredibly important, but uh, I would argue that discipline in general is unsustainable. And so stay with me for a second. So what I mean by that is like, if you don't want to train, and you go work out and you hate it, you can do that for two weeks or three weeks and go hate it. But if it's really good, if it's a good thing, if there's virtue in it, you should enjoy it a couple weeks in. And the discipline should actually transition over to motivation. And the same will happen as a, as a husband and a father. You know, it's like we had to go through the hard, I'm going to rabbit trail on you guys for a minute. But, you know, uh, I think it's important in this podcast to say something like this is that, that men need sex from their wives. Wives need affection from their husbands. And what often happens is that cycle is broken and neither get either one of those things. And at some point, somebody's got to step up and be the bigger person and give what they don't want to give. And and I, I would say right now, it's the man's job to give affection to your wife. And affection not with the intention of leading to sex, but to actually give her the affection she needs just to fill the love tank of affection. And don't worry about the sex. It'll come later. It'll come. But and so those are the things. And so there are times when that discipline really matters and that we went through this. I, I, I was not motivated all at all to give my wife affection. But you know what? I am now. I love giving my wife affection because that discipline, if done for the right reasons, if it's virtuous and you're not an evil sociopath, then eventually that discipline will turn into motivation. So what will happen is you, you white knuckle discipline the thing for two or three weeks and you put a bar on your back and squat. And what you'll find out is two weeks later, you kind of enjoy squatting or you kind of enjoy giving affection to your wife or pouring in wisdom to your kids. We have very intentional conversations at dinner every night with my family. We talk about, you know, church and religion and ecclesiology and theology and politics and culture and all the things I've been able to point. And so just like you said, like the stuff that my daughters have learned, they're carrying that into the relationships with them. They will with their husbands. They know exactly how we, my parents didn't do that. Right. So my parents like we vote for Ronald Reagan. And I'm like, why? It's like, well, because he's anti-abortion and that's it. You know, and you're just like, is there any more? Like, is there, you know, there was like, can you, and there was, there was, and maybe it wasn't even that. Maybe it was just like less. There was, there was never a why. It was just the hows. Well, the hows don't last very long. And so as men, I think we're called to pour into the whys. And so for me, those, I have never told my daughters the way my, the way my dad did just do the thing. And when I say why, you know, he said, cause I'm your dad or I'm the emperor or I'm the king or I don't, I don't do that. And, and it's not because I don't have the authority to do that. It's because I want it to actually stick. And so I do that with my daughters. When we talk about strength training, we talk about why every client that is my client, every client at Barbologic, every coach knows why strength is better than the other stuff. 
because it makes all the other physical attributes better. And it's not a two-way street. If you're, if you are sedentary and you sit on your couch and I teach you how to full range of motion squat, you not only get stronger, you get more mobile. But in, if I don't squat and I go to yoga class, I get more mobile, but I do not get more strong. So we explain the whys behind strength training. We explain the whys behind theology. We explain the whys behind culture and politics. All of those things we explain to our kids, to our wives, to our church, to our employees, to our clients, because the whys make the thing stick. And the whys eventually take the discipline and lead it to motivation. And I think that's huge. Yeah. Wow. That's really powerful. You you nailed it. You know, we we have to do these things today. Right? Like I'm drawn to this quote from a leader of my church who once said, if you live only for tomorrow, you'll have a lot of empty yesterdays today. We're always yeah. looking for the ideal. We're always looking, oh, I don't have a gym pass right now, or oh, the gym's too crowded, or I, could, I didn't get up today, or I had too much to eat today. I'll start tomorrow. Yep. Those are just excuses we're making. And yep. we've made those excuses how many times throughout our lives? Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. If we want to change our lives, we've got to be willing to do something different and start now. Like we need yep. to, we are men of action, just like you said. And that's, I don't know, that was really, really powerful. Like that really resonated with me. I can't imagine a better podcast. Throw in the, hit pause, throw in the earbuds and go do the thing right now. Go lift, go run, go do the thing while you're listening to the podcast. That's what, that's my favorite thing to do when I, you know, like I, I was in gym for too long. I'll, I can never listen to heavy metal or rap again. I'm so sick of hearing it in a gym <laughs> that I put in, I put in earbuds and listen to podcasts, right? Yeah. Or if I want to listen to music, it's like bluegrass. <laughs> and the people are like, what are you listening to? I'm like, Alison Krauss <laughs> and laugh at me, you know, but like mostly it's, yeah, it's podcast or, or, you know, or, you know, books, uh, audio books or whatever. Like what a great, what a great way to kill two birds with one stone. And so when you're listening to podcasts like this or other podcasts similar to this that, that are motivating, like, Put it in and use it as motivation to go do the thing right now. Yeah, it's key. Yeah, I really like that concept of how discipline evolves into motivation. My, my question to you though is, eventually that motivation is going to wane. So is mm-hmm. it is it almost like a cyclical thing that the way that you view it, where when the motivation wanes a little bit, you you have to go back and rely on the discipline to get back into that motivation? Yes and no. That's a great. That's a, actually it's a great question. So my experience and experience with our clients is that it starts as discipline. Uh, it turns into motivation and it becomes habit. And once Uh, it becomes habit, it's just not a question on whether it's not, it doesn't really feel like discipline to me anymore to train. You just train, right? Like my, just my, Mm -hmm. I had my 23rd anniversary this last weekend to my wife down to Bentonville, Arkansas, which is where Walmart headquarters is. And there's too many billionaires in a small town. They got great hotels and restaurants and, you know, and they've got great hiking trails and stuff. And we were at a hotel that had a crappy little hotel gym. And I got up at four 30 in the morning and went and got coffee and, went and worked out. And it it wasn't, I don't know that I was really motivated to work out. It's just what I do. You know, it's Mm -hmm. just like, there are just things you do that at some point, so if done, and and so if, if the cycle breaks and you start to miss the thing, and that happens too, right? There's times when I go on vacation, typically I try actually try to plan my vacations in a place to have a gym and have a place where I can do the things that I really enjoy. So I come back from vacation, like legitimately refreshed. But for example, we're talking about going to Washington, D.C., taking our kids out there. They've never seen, you know, the Smithsonian, the mall, the, con- you know, all that stuff. Right. And I don't know how easy it's going to be to train out there. So let's say I go out there six days and I don't train. And I, you know, and we walk all over the place and see all the stuff and do the touristy things. And I come home. Well, I got to start the cycle over again. Uh, now I've broken the cycle of training. So now I got to go back to discipline, train, let it turn into motivation, and then become the habit. And then once it becomes a habit, it's a habit. So eating's the same way. Like I just, you know, every, like I still love to eat crappy foods. I just don't eat crappy foods very often. And, you know, like I'd love to have a few Krispy Kreme donuts, but I'm not going to eat 12 of them and I'm not going to eat them three days a week or whatever the thing is. And so, um, you know, you kind of get into a thing and I actually just don't enjoy like fried foods and foods that make me feel like crap. I would never eat like, you know, I don't eat McDonald's, but you know, once every two years I'm on a road trip and you're on a highway and you're like, I guess we're going to pull in and get a chicken sandwich from McDonald's. You feel like crap for two hours after eating it. And I'm like, this is why I don't eat McDonald's, you know? And so it's not, um, but there were times in my life when, I mean, listen, when I was trying to gain a hundred pounds as a power lifter, I was eating McDonald's twice a day, every day. So <laughs> there were times in my life that that was the habit. So yeah, I, I think that the typical, the typical cycle is discipline to motivation to habit. And as long as that stays a habit, you're fine. And then when the habit breaks, you've got to start the cycle over. Do you do any gamification or try to game the system to gain motivation? Like, are, are there targets that you're aspiring to? I mean, I know it works a little bit differently sure. for everybody, but what do you, what do you use? I, I gamify everything. <laughs> yes. I am, uh, I'm probably OCD. I'm probably, you know, Dan, I'm probably like you. It's like, 
I gamify everything. Like I've got an Apple watch and a whoop and I'm like, I gamify, you know, I, I track my sleep. I track my heart rate, resting heart rate. I track my blood sugar in the morning, blood pressure. All, you know, I, I put a number to everything cause it works for me. And that helps drive motivation for me. For some people that would feel like totally overwhelming and they would hate doing those things. I like to track macros. I love that stuff. Uh, I've t- most of my clients don't want to track macros. One of the things we do as a nutrition coaches is we, we do what's called a, a visual food diary. We just have clients take pictures of their food and they upload it to their coach and then we break it down for them. But I, I actually want to track. So, you know, at, at um, between lunch and dinner every day, I look at how, how much protein, carbs and fat I have left for the day. And I start to plan my dinner meal, which we already kind of know what we're eating. And I think, okay, I've got to have an extra chicken breast or do this or whatever, eat enough protein. I've got to back off to, you know, a half serving of carbs to kind of hit my numbers. And then before I go to bed, I'm going to have to have a protein shake to do the thing. So I, I gamify all of it all the time uh, because that works for me. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that necessarily works for everybody. But I, I think finding whatever that thing is uh, for you is fantastic. So, yeah, for me, I love numbers. I'm definitely a little OCD and uh and love that stuff so that helps give me continued motivation it also again i get for sure i get that little dopamine hit every time i see like oh my heart rate was you know two beats lower last night than it was the night before or you know whatever the thing was so um yeah i gamify all of it all the time i mean i listen i gamify work i gamify being a ceo i get like you know i'm 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 a stats (laughs) when i was a kid i was a huge sports fan i don't watch sports at all anymore hardly i'd kind of like to get back to watching some golf and baseball every once in a while but i don't watch any sports but i was a diehard sports fan growing up as a kid i would get the sports almanac you know my parents would get me sports illustrated to take the swimsuit edition throw it in the trash can you know i'd be 12 years old they wouldn't let me see that one and i'd be like that's the only one i want <laughs> so they would give me the <laughs> sports almanac i would read the sports almanac cover to cover and memorize all the stats of all of sports everything in all of history and so I've just been wired for numbers my whole life. So I think my personality is just wired to gamify all of it. And so, yeah, it's a great question. And I think if that's you, I think finding ways to do that. I think I actually think those things like Fitbits and Whoops and Apple Watches and stuff are great to do. Um, we got a pool, a big Olympic pool right across the street from my house in the neighborhood. I hold my breath and swim back and forth on the short side of the pool as many times as I can. And I try to like beat my PRs for yeah. what? I don't know. Am I a competitive swimmer or a you know, do I, do I do free diving? No, I don't do any of that stuff, but like, it's just, I'm out there. I might as well turn it into a game, do the thing, you know? And so I, that's just, that's just who I am as again, I love it that a lot of my guy friends are that way too. A lot of the guys at church and my pastor is as bad as I am about this stuff. It's like, if you do a hard thing, you know, I'm the guy that's like, okay, just do one more set before you give yourself a drink of water. Like a good way to die, <laughs> a good way to get dehydrated, <laughs> but like still, you know, nobody's making me do it, but it's, I just kind of have that voluntary hardship thing wired in my head. It's like, come on, one more set, and then you can take a break or get a drink or do a thing. And so, yeah, I'm, I, I love gamifying that stuff. I, I think a lot of guys are like that, though, too, with the competitive nature, especially if you get a group of guys together, right? Like like you said, sure. you're in a pool. You're going you're gonna to find a way to, to make it into a competition of some kind right. or whatever. But That's the right. other cool thing about gamification, you were talking about macros, and, and I'm the same way. You can also gamify out the little rewards here and there. So, like, That's right. if you're if you're tracking macros and you want a nice cocktail at the end of the night, you can plug that in at the beginning of the day and then work your That's day. Exactly what I do, knowing that it's built in there already. That's exactly right. We, we the two the two things that I'll do there is I, I'm a I don't know if you guys know I'm a huge whiskey guy. I've got like 350 whiskeys up in my library. You could check my my Instagram is real strong. I've got some pictures of my whiskey library there. So yeah, I'd love to I'd love to have a glass of whiskey, but like that's a completely empty calories. It does mean yeah. no good whatsoever, right? So, right. so you put it in and you pre-plan for it. The other thing is Springfield, we have a, and there, it's kind of expanded all over the United States. So a lot of your listeners will, will know this name, but we have a Andy's frozen custard, which is headquartered yeah. here in Springfield. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I, I go get a kid's cup, which is enough, right? And it sounds like here's a big 250 pound man. And I go get the little like quarter, <laughs> quarter cup, kids cup, but it's, you know, it's five bites, four bites of Andy's frozen custard. It's enough to satiate me. And it, it's like 300 calories for, for that. And I can just plug that into my macros and be like, all right, I'm going to get 300 calories of mostly carbs and some fat. And if I plan for that, then I can just back that off for breakfast and lunch and kind of throughout the day. And I bank those calories. So I have them in the evenings to do the same thing with cocktails or whatever. So yeah, that's the way to gamify it, make it work. Again, some people hate that, but for me, it works perfectly. Well, I appreciate you spending the time with us. You know, it's, we've been on for about an hour now, so I want to be kind of conscious of everyone's time here, but, uh, why don't you let everyone know where they can find you on uh, on the internet? Sure. 
So yeah. So again, I'm at Reynolds Strong personally on Instagram and Twitter, uh, primarily. And then Barbell Logic is easy to find. Barbell Logic on all the social medias, barbellogic.com. Uh, you can, you can find us online. Again, I always tell people we, we've got, um, we've got a very popular podcast. It's the most popular strength podcast, uh, out there and, um, and put out lots of fantastic information. Been doing that since 2017. We also have a, a super active YouTube channel, uh, where you can learn. So one of the things we did with our content, because we're a service company, we, we kind of did things backwards. So a lot of influencers will build that influence and that following, and then they'll monetize that following. We were actually able to monetize early and do really well as a company and then take the money that we made and really make incredible production value stuff. So our videos are very high production value on YouTube. Same thing with, with the podcast, you know, written articles, ebooks, all that kind of stuff. And because we're a service company, all of our content's always free. It will always be free. It'll never be behind a paywall. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the paywall. If you're a content company, that's how you have to make money. But we make money from service. So the content's free. So what I often do for people, we would love to have your listeners come on as Barbell Logic clients. The quick pitch I'd give you there is that your first month as a Barbell Logic client is always 100% free. There's no contract. There's no questions asked. You're like, what's the catch? There's no catch. I would rather give you that month free than pay it to Zuckerberg for Facebook ads. And so you get it for free. It's our job to keep you. You can try out online coaching. Go to barbellogic.com. Try out online coaching. It's fantastic. We will pair you with the perfect coach for you. You fill out a questionnaire. And we've got coaches. We Again, we have so many coaches that will find the perfect coach for you. So that's great. But I also know it's kind of a high ticket purchase. And so it takes some time to sort of build trust with people to do that. So I often just send people to the content. Listen to the podcast. Go to YouTube. If you want to learn how to squat or deadlift or bench press or press or anything, you can literally type how to squat. Barbell Logic. You probably don't even have to type in Barbell Logic. It'll be one of the top videos on YouTube. How to deadlift, how to bench press, whatever. That's a great place to start. And you can learn everything you need to know about strength training and start to build that relationship with Barbell Logic, who we are as experts in the field. There's tons of free, amazing articles, ebooks. I've got an incredible writing team. Uh, my editor in chief is an attorney that, you know, isn't practicing as attorney anymore, is a full time editor in chief for us. And so that content's a place, great place to go. You find all that on the website or on any of the social medias. And so that's, that's great. And then, you know, if you have any questions, it's, I'm easy to find. You can find my email right on the website, reach out, ask questions. You can, you can ping me on Twitter. I'm happy to, you know, check out videos of people. Like I have guys send me videos on Twitter of their, you know, Hey Matt, I want to protect your time, but we check out my squat. I'm happy to do that. Happy to, ch- you know, I'll give you a breakdown on your squat video, your deadlift video or whatever. I try to be um, really gracious there because people were for me when I'm, when I was young and broke. So uh, so that's how you find us. Cool, man. And I meant to ask you the, the podcast, you, you guys have put it on hold for, for the time being, right? Is it? Yeah, it's about back? to come back next month. So we, uh, the long story short there is we've done podcasts at least one a week and up to three a week every week since 2017. And I think a lot of times the podcast is just, it's a long game. You know, I mean, certainly it's yeah. got to be high quality content and we, I think we did that well. Um, I am the subject matter expert on that podcast. And when you're the subject matter, and I think I've done 600 podcasts. I don't care what the subject is. Eventually you're like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about anymore. It's 600 podcasts, you know? <laughs> and so we're not an interview show. So it's, you know, it's not like you can just bring on another person to interview. So, um, but we've taken a couple months off and we did that because we landed this uh, big military contract, a huge military contract. And we've really been all in on trying to onboard, um, EOD, uh, Air Force guys. And so that is up and running now. And so the podcast should come back in June. Uh, it's the last day of May right now. By the time this comes out, that's podcast should be coming out soon. So yeah, you'll have new episodes coming out, but again, just great evergreen material there on the Barbell Logic podcast. It's not, you know, it's not, um, based in sort of culture or current events or anything. So anything that's on the podcast is going to be good forever. And there's a great yeah. series on there. You can, there's a series like how to get started, the getting started series. So if you're like, I, it's like 10 episodes and are all probably 40 minutes long and you can, you can kind of drive everything, you know, stuff about programming. How do I program or how do I go from novice programming and intermediate? That kind of stuff is all in the podcast. So new ones will be coming out and, and we try to speak to at the podcast. Now, when we first started the podcast, it was really Barbell Logic was originally the podcast and it was a systematic walk through strength training. And we started at the most basic stuff. And we, tr- we, we got a little more, you know, a little more advanced as we went. And now the podcast is speaks to lifters, speaks to emerging up and coming coaches and speaks to business owners. And, and those pod, those episodes are different. And so whoever you, if you're, you know, you don't have to listen to all of them. If you're a lifter and you just want to listen to lifter ones, listen to that. And, you know, if you're a coach or a business owner, you can find those as well. So excited to bring those back. I'm, it's been nice to have this short break, first break I've had in, 
in uh, six years or so and excited to get the podcast up and rolling again. That's awesome. Yeah. And at the risk of blowing a little sunshine up your skirt, I can definitely say that the, uh, the getting started series has been super useful to me in terms of, I mean, you guys break that down from programming to equipment to, to yep. form to, you know, the whole, the whole shebang. And it, it, if you listen to that whole thing from start to finish, you're going to go into the gym feeling like you really know what you're doing right away. Yeah. So yeah, I thank you. I, I definitely, definitely recommend that one. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, man. Well, dude, it's been a pleasure. Um, hopefully we can do this again sometime. For sure. We'll, uh, we'll get this posted on the website at untamingmasculinity.com with all the show notes and all the links to your stuff. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that the guys are reaching out to you as Perfect. well. Thank you guys for having me on the show. Oh, it's been great. Great. our pleasure. It. Thank you. Great having you. Thank you. We'll ask the guys that are listening, you know, if you guys found value of this, leave us a rating and review on the podcast player. That definitely helps us get the word out to, to other men and, you know, keep coming back. We'll have more great interviews, more great topics. So until next week, we'll leave you with just one question. What are you doing to untame your masculinity?